Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days And they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows." I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces." The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. 
He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. All right, so the goal today is to make this a two-part message. Or should I rephrase that, to keep it as a two-part message. (laughs) Yeah, so so Chuck saved me on the series. And so he says, well, we don't have anything planned for, for Palm Sunday. And I said, oh, yeah, you're right. So... So it still fits within the time frame. Yes, God, you're good. All right, so, so ready to listen fast? Because I'm ready to talk fast. Um, so I'm, a, I'm really excited. You know that, okay? Book of Daniel is such an exciting book. And so as we've been going through it, we've seen that the, the impact of Daniel is going to be great as we have a consideration of his God. I mean, that's above and beyond. Get rid of everything else, right? It's all about God, right? And, and what God is revealing through this prophet this man we refer to as daniel and then through world leaders that daniel was interacting with it's just an amazing thing and so through his god through his life and then through his writing and so last week we talked about how we are coming into this part of this um the impact of his writing and i showed you the picture of uh kumran cave number four where there was discovered then the prophetic writings of Daniel. And so there are, in the other caves as well, other of the writings of Daniel that were discovered that were there all within this one book, okay? And I don't think I mentioned it last week, but there are, and I have it in the sermon note sheet, so maybe you read it, but there only the Psalms and Deuteronomy, I think it was Deuteronomy, Exodus, thank you, um, outrank um, Daniel in the number of manuscripts that were discovered there, okay? So it's an amazing thing. So these um, Jewish uh, scribes um, that were there. There were a lot of debates on who they are. And that kind of, anyways, but we're very enamored with the book of Daniel. And the importance of it was that it substantiated our Hebrew text that we have today, okay? And then gave credence to the fact that this Daniel was written when it was declared to be written, which is huge, especially, I mean, it's already with the detail that we see in Daniel chapter 7, but when we get to Daniel 9, 10, and specifically Daniel 11, it's like mind-boggling that the details that that God gave to Daniel hundreds of years before Greece ever existed. They weren't even a blip on the map. God is having Daniel write the details of when they would be an empire after Alexander and when the the kingdom would be split into fours and all that. But we'll get into it then. Just exciting stuff, okay? And so so I want you to be um, mindful of that. And then we talked about the fact that as we get into this prophetic portion of Daniel, beginning in Daniel chapter 7, that we see that the visions that Daniel have really wound up building upon the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, the dream that he had in Daniel chapter 2. Okay, And so you can see that in this illustration here, the lion, and we'll go through each of these individually real quickly again, but the lion is, is with the, the head of gold, because that was Babylon. Then you have the bear that was lopsided on one side with three ribs in its mouth. We'll talk about that in a moment. Was Medo-Persia, which was the, the silver. And then you have the leopard with the four wings, okay, which was Greece. Okay? And then you have this terrible beast that had ten horns. Okay? The beast itself is the iron legs. And then the ten horns relate to the ten toes, which were an iron clay substance. Okay? So that's all we want to talk about again on that. And so after the, the, the after action reports that I received um, last week, after the message, okay, um, were favorable. I appreciate that. But there was also constructive criticism that I have a lot of things I'm visualizing in my brain that I'm not communicating. 
Okay, so so I'm trying a little bit here. Okay, um, somebody asked me about dates, and I don't really have dates up there other than you got a generic date up there. Okay, so for those of you who are visual, I am as well. So I get that when I was told that. Okay, here's the map. Okay, and so that's Babylon, the the the, the empire of, of Babylon, and and you can see um, what all they had. Okay, and so. Again, we talked about that the, the lion was Nebuchadnezzar, or it's Babylon, but it was very clearly Nebuchadnezzar um, as well because the illustration of how the, the, the wings, the feathers of the eagle were plucked and he was raised up like a man, okay? And then we went to the bear, um, it was Medo-Persia. Again, it was lopsided, okay, on a, one of its sides. And I said to you that the, the word there for side, um, the word rib, let me, let me just bring this this way. The word rib is literally the word that's normally used for a side. So, for example, um, in Genesis, where God took a rib of Adam, literally it's the word side. It's also the word that's used in a tabernacle with the sides of the tabernacle, or you call it the ribs of the tabernacle, but it was really referring to the sides. This word side, okay, so there's two words for side that are being used here, but one of them is being translated as rib. And the other one's being used for it's translated side. I want to submit to you the word that's translated side really could be authority, okay? Um, and that's how it's used elsewhere, even in the book of Daniel, okay? So that one authority, one power was raised up, became greater, one side, if you would, okay? The, the Persians became greater than the Medes over time. The Me- Media, the country of Media, was actually the, the more powerful originally, but the Medes and the Persians joined forces against the Babylonians. It kind of makes sense, right? Uh, because you got a common enemy, you joined forces, but then the Persians became more powerful than the Medes, okay? The three ribs, I okay, mentioned last week, were Babylonia, the three major empires that, that they... They took over Babylonia, Egypt, and then what's referred to as Phrygia here, many people refer to as Lydia, okay? So, but it's Asia Minor, up near Turkey. So three major areas that they would then conquer, and they were told to go out and, and to kill and to eat and devour. Then from there, it goes into unknown kingdoms, okay? This is where it drives the liberals crazy, okay? Because it's like, how can Daniel be doing this? He has to have written this after the fact, but he didn't. Okay, and so we now have the Grecian kingdom that comes, and we'll talk a lot about the Grecian kingdom over the next weeks, okay, because a lot of the prophecies of Daniel have to deal with um, the Grecian kingdom um, in detail, great detail. But it's a leopard with four wings because Alexander the Great moved faster than anybody could ever imagine to conquer the world, okay? And so, again, remember I talked about, so that's up here in Greece, okay? And it was Ionia, the Ionia territory at the time. And Alexander's father, Philip, was being pummeled. They were being pummeled by Persia. If we go back to the previous one, remember Persia went up to here and had a little bit going into there. They, so the, their kingdom extended into, toward there, and they, and they just kept beating on Ionia. And so Alexander was a boy, and he grew up. Think about it. If you grew up in Ukraine right now, you hate who? Makes sense. If you grew up in Ionia territory at that time, you hated Persia. Darius, we talk about Darius and Darius and all that kind of stuff. He didn't like the, that guy. Does it make sense? Okay. It was not a, a, a favorable name to them. So the Darius, Darius was a um, like a king name. Okay. And so it's not just one. You have one, two, and three and that kind of stuff. David talked about that a few weeks ago. And so, but they hated that name. Okay. So they didn't want any part of of, of the Persians. And so Alexander, when he took over, he'd wanted nothing more than to wipe out the Persians. Okay? To wipe out the Persians, you wipe out the entire Persian kingdom. But then he continues on. And so he, he takes over the entire thing. And I talked about how there was a speed bump at Tyre, Tyre Sidon. Okay? And you can go and do that. It's a phenomenal history. Um, we don't have time to talk about that right now. Um, but it's in the, um, Ezekiel, um, the prophet Ezekiel. God gave him uh, prophecy regarding um, what would happened with uh, Alexander when he went to Tyre. Again, not by name, but it's by great detail that's there. It's phenomenal detail um, in the book of Ezekiel. Anyways, and so, so he continues on, okay, and he goes through. One thing I want to stop and I want to mention as we come through here um, 
is that until this time, and even through this time, Jerusalem continues to always be protected. This is, a, this is an aside, okay? Just kind of, it's, it's an amazing thing through history, though. There are times when God allows Jerusalem to be pummeled and times when he just kind of puts a bubble over them, okay? And we're going to talk about the time when they're going to be pummeled with Antiochus Epiphanes IV, or Antiochus IV, the Epiphanes, excuse me. Um, but through the, the rest of this, after Babylon has destroyed them, remember, God raises up a Persian king, Cyrus, to do what? To rebuild the temple, okay? And then Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem, okay? And so God's working through that, and so and he's, he's putting a kind of a bubble about them, okay? So even when Alexander comes through here and he's devastating everything, he doesn't devastate Jerusalem coming through here, okay? Just kind of fun stuff. Anyways, so um, you get the four heads, and we talk about the four heads that when Alexander then died, the kingdom was split to uh, four kings, okay? And I have a picture of that here for you as well, okay? So this is the, the Grecian kingdom, and so they were split between Cassander, Lysicomus, Seleucid, and um, the Ptolemies, okay? And so the Seleucids, it's way over here, but really they were centralized here in Syria, okay? In the Syrian area. And so when we get to Daniel 9, 10, 11, okay? We're going to be talking about the kings of the north and the kings of the south. We're really going to be talking about the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, okay? Okay, so you'll see this map again later on, but when we see it, you're going to be seeing it with a bunch of arrows and a bunch of and everything else going on, because when we go through the, the chapter, we're going to be like looking at all the, the fights and the battles and, and how Berenice, one of the, the, the daughters, was given to the other king, and, and he disrespected her and sent her back, and da 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 da, da. It's all just amazing stuff that's in Daniel hundreds of years before it ever happened. It's just incredible stuff. Anyway, can't talk about it now. All right, we can move on. Then we have the terrible beast, which is Rome, okay? And now, again, prophecy is best understood after it happens. So we're making the assumptions, because God didn't tell us that this is who these are, we're making the assumptions based upon history that these play in. And we saw one empire go into another empire, go into another empire, to go into another empire, okay? And so we have Rome, which was a devastating empire um, to everybody. They just crushed <laughs> And they, they would just destroy force as they went in because they would be making the siege ramps and everything else. And so force would be destroyed. There's a lot of thought processes that many of the deserts that are even in the Middle East, like in Israel, so they got, were really forests. Like when you talk about the wilderness, that really it was a wilderness, like a forest. And it wasn't really a desert, okay? But that Rome just raped the land. When, um, when, they, when they would go in. And so there's just this devastating, the, the teeth of iron and how they would just crush things and stuff like that. Anyways, so um, it was different from all others. Ten horns, okay? And so, but that's future, okay? And so we know that from chapter 2 that there's a, that's going to come from it, okay? And there's always been a great debate on who the ten horns are, okay? I'm not going to tell you who they are. You can go back to 2009, you can go through the series on Revelation, you can listen to some of the stuff where I do some of the conjectures, and, but, but the reality is we don't know. We, we don't know. There's a lot of conjectures who it could be, da-da-da-da-da, but it hasn't happened. Does it make sense? So they're conjectures. So to sit here and waste time is not time to do that right now, okay? So the ten horns are there, but we know that coming up from the ten, supplanting three is going to be what? Say again? One, One who is going to be... Oh, so that's another map of Rome, who's going to be the, the pompous beast, okay? Now, we know then right off the bat, and I only brought this up not to distract everything, but because there are many people who want to, again, make this pompous horn, because we're going to be talking about Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes, as a pompous horn, okay? But it's a different pompous horn. But they want to make this one Antiochus because then you can get rid of the, the millennial reign of Christ and you put things together, and it's not. We know it's not. It can't be Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes, because of where it's at. It would have been with the leopard. Does that make sense? But it wasn't. It's with the terrible beast. And it's coming out of the, the ten horns of the terrible beast. And we read Revelation last week. If you were here, okay, we read Revelation. And we saw how all these things are, are tying together. Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Revelation 17, okay? It's amazing how all these things tie together, okay? And so these ten horns represent the ten kings, which um, are going to be there in the book of Revelation, okay? And one of, there's going to be another one that's going to rise up from amongst them. Um, it's going to supplant three, and he's going to be a pompous horn. I'm not even going to tell you, you know, who it is. I don't know who it is. Could he be alive right now? Yes, he could be, okay? No man knows the what? The day or the hour. So Satan, I think, I mean, I, a lot of people mentioned something like this in Sunday school, and people kind of look at it. 
Satan doesn't know. Satan's got to continually be seeking to destroy the plan of God in Israel. Get it? And so, as John said, in, there, even now there are many antichrists. Okay? So there, there is, Satan is continually seeking to, to destroy the plan of God. So can I say that probably there is one on the earth today? Yeah, probably is. 100%. Okay? Is it Vladimir Putin? I'm not going to say that. But yeah, maybe so. He's clearly working, trying to destroy plans of God and all that kind of stuff, right? Maybe it is. Hitler clearly was, a, was an antichrist. Okay? He's trying to destroy the Jews. Make sense? So you clearly know that somebody's working for Satan at that moment when they're trying to destroy the plan of God and the people of God. Make sense? But was he Antichrist? No, he wasn't the Antichrist. He wasn't that guy. How do I know that? Well, the end time didn't happen. Doesn't make sense? Okay? But God used him to fulfill prophecies. Isn't this kind of fun stuff? Because what came as a result of Hitler trying to destroy the Jews? Hosea chapter 6, verse 2 and 3 was fulfilled. Israel returned to the land. He revived his people. After two days, Yahweh revived his people, and he brought them back into the land, and they made them a nation again. All as a result of Satan trying to destroy the plan of God. Oh, he did, again, like with the cross. And trying to destroy the plan of God, he what? Fulfilled the plan of God. Isn't it kind of fun? Isn't this exciting stuff? This isn't taking God by surprise. So even as the nations rage, and I appreciate Psalm 46, you know, and how you read it, even as all this is going on, God's got a plan. Okay, and I don't understand it, and it devastates my heart when I think of the, the, the trials and the tribulations that people are going through right now in the midst of all this. Does it make sense? But the plan of God is being, being worked, and I can trust wholeheartedly in that, and that's where I need to be. So his identity, we saw then his blasphemy is really where we're picking this up today, okay? But I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. His blasphemy is exactly what we would expect it to be then, as somebody who is opposed to God, right? What does he do? He speaks against God and his saints. Okay? So anytime that's happening in the world, who's at work? Satan's at work. I, it, you know, sometimes, again, we forget that we do not wrestle against what? Flesh, Flesh and blood. We wrestle against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Does it make sense? I mean, it's just, it's going on. Even right now, there is a war going on around us and above us and through us and however you want to state that, okay? But what I know is that my God is greater than them all. And God's going to win, okay? And God's only allowed this for what, for his purpose. Whatever that purpose is, God has allowed it. He didn't need to. Does it make sense? He didn't need to allow Satan to tempt Eve, but he did. And it didn't take him by surprise when Eve, what? Stumbled and fell and offered it to her husband and he ate it. Before the foundations of the world were laid. Before time immortal or t- for, before time perpetual. God has planned the hope that we have. It's exciting stuff. All right. So his blasphemy, his pompous words are directed toward God and the saints. And that leads us then into the Ancient of Days. Um, God himself. And I want to do an aside real quick on this description, okay? Because this isn't from Daniel 7, but it sort of is from Daniel 7. From the perspective of, it's from this picture. You say, okay, so now the guy's listening on audio. Sorry, you got to go to the YouTube to see the picture. So I had two pictures that I, I, I settled between. Ah, you know, it's really kind of cold because as we see the description of the throne, the fire is pouring out of the thrones and, and there's, there's the books that are there and, and, and the picture of the Ancient of Days on his throne and that kind of stuff, right? But what you'll note here is that I've done a very poor job of this. I was told, Ace, that I should have got enlisted you a little bit on this. But I, I, um, I blurred out his, his face and his hands. Whoever the artist is, on both these pictures, it was, drove me bonkers. They actually had... A, disc- a, a picture of God, his face and everything. What do I know biblically? No man has seen him. No man has seen him. But, you know, and, and this is a little, my little side, but what I got out of this, and this is going to be straight, it was a white guy. It was a white, it was a white old grandpa looking kind of guy. Okay? God isn't a white guy. Michael Card wrote a song, I've never forget the line, it continues, it comes back to me multiple times. But we've made you in our image, so our faith is idolatry. We are so worried about making God look like us rather than us look like God. 
That's what God has designed us for. That's his purpose. That's Romans chapter 8. God has a purpose for us, a predestined purpose for us. And that is to be conformed to the image of Christ, not for Christ to be conformed to the image of Bob. So, sorry, a little aside, but I couldn't believe when I saw that. Oh, man, this is awful. So, Ace, I should have got you, and so you could have done, like, what I, what I really wanted is, like, you can see where the fire is all yellow and everything. I wanted to have this glow just coming out, because that's who he is. You read Revelation 1, and it's like this powerful, like, beyond the sun kind of brilliance that's coming out, you know? And Daniel's going to talk about that later when he sees one of them. It's just, it's like, it's just the, 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 the brilliance is just great that's there, okay? So, so we see this ancient of days come, the, the thrones, plural, are set, and then he is set upon his throne, right? And there's fire coming out from the midst of the throne. And then he's surrounded by a thousand, and then ten thousand times ten thousands, okay? That he's surrounded by this strong of people who are giving witness and praise to him. Isn't this kind of exciting? When you, again, we're not reading Revelation five and, uh, 4 and 5 today, but you can... I challenge you to go read, read them, okay? It's talking about the throne room of God. And you see about the thrones. There's 24 thrones that are surrounding the throne of God, right? And he's got the sea of glass that's in front of it. And there's a rainbow that's wrapping around his head. But when you get into chapter 5, then you see the, thr- the, the lamb come from the midst of the throne. He comes out of the midst of the throne, which is really kind of cool. Because God comes as the, the, uh, um, in the imagery of a lamb. That's who? Jesus. And he takes the scroll out of the Father's hand. I can't co- comprehend that because it's coming from. And one, the other thing I like about this one, note the throne here has what? Two seats because when Jesus ascends to heaven, he what? He sits at the right hand of the Father. Okay, so, so and they're all one God. So it's one throne, okay? And it's, it's all one God. You could have the Holy Spirit in there too, okay? And so it's just, it's a really mind-boggling thing for us to think about how can three be yet one, but it is, it is true, okay? And so we have this description of the Ancient of Days that he comes, right? And um, his court then is set, okay? And in this court, again, we have then multiple of, of um, thrones. Now, what's interesting here is the word for the court being set is the judgment, is, is, is the term for like justice, kind of thing okay and when you think back think back for for me it's easiest if i think back to like the middle ages when i think back to england and stuff like that and i think about the king ultimately the 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 ruler of the land was also the judge the ultimate judge of the land okay and so that's the picture that's here okay and so you've got this courtroom if you would this court the king the king's court being set but it's not just a court like um we picture like the the pleasantries and the and the um oh, the jackal uh, no, so the jester coming in the court jester and like get get rid of that picture this is more when you think of god's court it's kind of like a court boom 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 you know court and so and then we see revelation 20 kind of happen here don't we because now what what do we see we see the books the scrolls the books that are opened okay and in revelation 20 when we see the the great white throne room of god right we see his throne that's there and we see before him what all the dead small and great right rich poor doesn't really matter they're all there before him and they are judged revelation 20 check me out this they are judged according to what what was written in the books and whoever's name was not found written in the book, singular, of life, that's the Lamb's book of life, singular, were cast into the lake of fire. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Okay, and so the imagery that's there in Revelation, also we see then in the book of Daniel. Okay, and so there are books, plural, that are there. Those are the books of works, which we all will be judged based upon. Which, if you would, if you don't mind, we're all going to be condemned based upon. None of us, no person on the face of this earth who's ever lived, is living, or shall live, will, will be found just based upon their works. They will be condemned based upon their works. But there is an, another book, singular, the Lamb's Book of Life, where when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, your name is... 
written down. There's a new name, it's written down in glory, and it's mine. Yes? Okay, and so it's there. And so you're condemned. Before the throne, you are condemned. But then the Lamb, Jesus, says, but Father, His name is written in my book. His name is written in my book. How fun is that? And so we have a, a little imagery of this here, okay? Again, Messiah hasn't come yet, and we're not reading about that other singular book, okay? But again, progressive revelation, right? So when John writes, he gives us a little bit more of the picture that Daniel's given to us, okay? And so we see this courtroom that's going on. Now, what we understand then from all this, okay, is that the Ancient of Days, okay, this is all going to come into play when we begin to see this pompous horn, the Ancient of Days comes, okay? So as now we, we look at this Ancient of Days, and he's seated, he's seated in his court, okay? And verse 26 says um, that, I'm sorry, the, yeah, verse 25, we, we see this pompous, um, pompous horn. He's speaking against the Most High, the Ancient of Days, right? And then he's going to begin to persecute the saints, right? But eventually, verse 26, the court shall be seated and they shall take away his what? His dominion, okay? So in the midst of, in the midst of this pompous horn, who is, I think, um, from Revelation 12, Revelation 13, setting himself up as God, right? And so we see the mark of the beast. That's going to be, not now, that's in the second half of the final seventh, the 70th week of Daniel's vision. We'll get there when we get to Daniel 9, okay? That I don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to be around for it. I don't really believe that. I, don't be, I won't be around for the mark of the beast. Bark and beast don't, it doesn't even, it's blipping on my map for me, okay? Other than the fun of trying to look at the forerunners and precursors of it, okay? Which I can spend a lot of time talking to you about. Anyways, because I think the world's being set up for it, okay? And it's, it's just amazing to me as we watch it. Anyways, but I don't have to worry about it because I'm not going to be here, okay? So, but what we're told at that time is that they have to take the mark of the beast or they won't be able to buy or sell anything. But related, integrated into taking the mark of the beast is just exactly like it was in Daniel 6. Is that, uh, not Daniel 6. Uh, where was it? Daniel 4. Is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ananias, Shan uh, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael? They wouldn't bow. Three, three, Daniel three, sorry. Okay, it's the exact same thing, okay? They knew that they had to bow down in what? Worship, okay? Same thing, Revelation 13, that when they take the mark of the beast, it's also going to be an act of worship, okay? And so, so at that moment, people are going to make a decision. They're either going to worship the, the, the um, mark of the beast, or they're going to worship the, the, the beast, or they're not going to worship the beast, okay? That's kind of what's playing out here. And so in the middle of all that, so God shows up and God's always there, right? But it's kind of like woof, moments where it's like, whoa, you know? And so in the midst of all that, God's going up. The wrath of God's going to be poured out. You go to the book of Revelation. That's when the bulls of God's wrath begin to be poured out. God begins to reveal to the world that guess what? This guy's a nobody and I'm the one and only true God. Okay. It's really kind of fun stuff. Okay. And so then we go to then the son of man who we're now introduced to that in the midst of this courtroom scene, Okay, then there is one like a son of man, okay, who comes, how? In the clouds, in the clouds of heaven. Isn't this kind of exciting stuff? Okay, he, he comes in the clouds of the hoofbeats of the Roman army. Did you read that? I didn't read that either. He came in the clouds of what? Of heaven. Isn't it mind-boggling how theologians can, can, can twist things around? I just don't get it. I mean, Acts chapter 1, you can go there and look at it, right? You, you men of Galilee, what do you stand gazing looking up? This, this Jesus of Nazareth, who you see going into the clouds, will come how? In the same manner. I mean, how did Jesus leave? In, 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 in the, the, the clouds of a, of a, of a hoof, of a, of a horse? No. He went up into the heavenly clouds, and he's going to come back in the heavenly clouds. And Daniel's even declaring it to us hundreds of years before it even occurs, right? Exciting stuff. So we see this one. He came with the clouds of heaven, okay? And so I think that happens in Revelation chapter 10. That's just my little side. You can talk to me later about that. And he is given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, okay, throughout all that time. And so, so, um, so he comes, and he's given it. Now, that's... Um, Interesting stuff there, and I don't want to hide it, you know, kind of <coughs> ignore it. But how does he get a kingdom? 
how, how was it given to him? Okay? Well, again, that shows us that there's a hierarchy where? In the Godhead. I mean, 1 Corinthians 11 is very clear that the head of man, or the head of a woman is man. The head of man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. Okay? I mean, it's just, it's how it is, that, that there is this positional hierarchy um, within the Godhead. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? I can go on with that on so rabbit trails talking about it. But, but it doesn't bother me. Okay? And so a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon, are gonna, they love to play things out like this and say, well, they're distinctly two different people. And I say, yeah, amen, I agree with that. They are. And yet they are distinctly what? One. <laughs> well, how can that be? I don't know. If I knew, I'd be God. But I'm not. But I'm okay with accepting what God has declared. Does it make sense? And so I don't have to redefine. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to give an answer for it. One day I will give an answer for what I believe. But I don't have to try to, to give an account for that right now. I just know God said so. So anyways, so he comes. He comes in the clouds. He receives his kingdom. And his kingdom is going to be what? Never ending. It's going to be everlasting, right? It's kind of fun stuff. Okay, so he comes. And then we're transitioned to, um, to this group of people called the saints of the Most High. Okay? Um, and so this group of people, to me, are um, very interesting from the perspective that I think it's us. Okay? In some manner, or, or those who come after us. Okay? Um, and what do we see? First of all, is that... Oh, I want to handle this real quick. They are not the people. So... Drop down to verse, um, verse 27 in, in chapter 7 here. It says, the kingdom in, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. So, again, you can say, well, wait, it says they're given to who? The people. But the people I'm talking about is turn a page or so over in your Bible to Daniel chapter 9. And this is the beginning of the, sev- the, the, the 70 weeks, which we're not going to talk about right now. We'll talk about later, but just other than to point this part out, okay? So beginning of verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for who? Your people, okay? And for your holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for the iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be 70 weeks, or seven weeks and 62 weeks, the streets shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome time. Okay, stop there, because we're not going to go further into that. In the beginning of that, though, as we get into these 70 weeks, in a couple weeks from now, um, these 77s, if you would, um, they are going to be specifically for who? Israel. How do we know that? Because it says, your people, and what else does it say? Your holy city, okay? So there is a definition there of who is being talked about. Over here, we're told very specifically that it's not your people, it's the people, okay, from that perspective, okay? Um, And it's the saints of the Most High, okay? And how it's being looked at then, I see it as a, a slight distinction, okay? When you get into end time prophecy, um, we, I kind of, talked about this just a little bit this morning um, in Sunday school, that in my brain, okay, this is conjecture, okay, this is my taking of, of biblical stuff and bringing it out. I see predominantly, I see more, more dispensations than this, but I see predominantly, mainly, three major dispensations. There's pre-Israel, Israel, post-Israel. But then you got end times. Then because you got you get the 70th, the 70th week from Daniel 9, which we'll talk about again later, it's going to be played out. How does that play out? Because God's going to begin working through Israel one more time, but we already have the testimony of who? Jesus Christ on the earth. Make sense? So how does that play out? Because we're told that there's going to be sacri- sacrifices. Read the book of Ezekiel and all that kind of stuff. There's going to be sacrifices and everything else that's going on. How does that play out when, when there's already the testimony of Jesus Christ on the earth? I can't answer all those questions. Okay? We can go read Revelation together and we can talk about that, but how it'll actually very much play out. I don't know, because I haven't been there. It hasn't happened yet. But God knows. Does it make sense? Okay? So, these saints, okay, are during that time. How do I know these saints are end-time saints? That they're the ones that are living during the time 
of the bowls of God's wrath being poured out on the earth. How do I know that? No, no, it didn't say that here in Daniel 7. How do I know that? Because the pompous horn is going to war against them. He's going to persecute them. And that's where he's at. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so I believe the church is going to be gathered up to Christ prior to the 70th week. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay. But just suffice it to say for now that what we commonly refer to as the rapture of the church. Okay. I believe in a pre-70th week taking away of the church. I'm pre-trib. Okay? I just don't like the word trib because we're going to be going through trib before the trib. Whatever. Okay? So, but I am, I am a firm believer, okay, based upon the book of Daniel, okay, and then go progress to Revelation beyond that, that the church will be taken out of the way because God's going to be working through Israel, in and through Israel again. The church will be taken away. Okay? But that doesn't mean the testimony of Christ is taken away. I, I am, that's why I love about YouTube and audio and different things that we have going on out there. You know, I joked with somebody this week. <laughs> One day, you, you, looking at elders, you might hear me ask about, can we, can we get 20 years of Host Monster subscription? Because if, cause think about it. I, I go for 100 years of it. Anyways, pay Host Monster for, to, for 100 years or whatever of, of containing our data so that when the rapture comes, we're already paid up. Because every time people go to listen to our messages, they go to our website. So if our website goes away, then our testimony goes away. Does it make sense? And so, uh, but they can close down the, the actual page, but if people are still linking into it, then they're still hearing the gospel. And it's amazing to me, again, how many people are listening to our messages. That's mind-boggling to me. Um, the last thing I just saw a couple weeks ago was 1,230 a day spending 15 minutes or more on our webpage. That's not counting the ones that are downloading messages and listening them, um, you know, not just streaming them. Like when I do it, I'll stream, okay? But if I downloaded it, it would take less than five minutes to, do to download it, and I don't even count that in, 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 in statistics. 1,230 a day, over 36,000 a month coming to this little bitty church and listening to messages. Isn't that mind-boggling? Do you think God has the ability to allow our testimony to continue to stay even after he takes the church out of the way? So regardless of all that, just think about the potentiality for people to be saved even during that time. It would really drive the beast crazy because they have to make a decision. It's going to be like um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah having to bow down, right? And so at that moment, they got to take the mark of the beast. But it comes to clear, oh, this is what my buddies were telling me all those years, and now they're gone. I get it. This is the mark of the beast. i got to make a decision to worship who? The beast or to worship God. And I believe at that moment, for many of them, it will be the testimony of Christ that they'll understand. Now, can I prove? No, I can't. I mean, that's, that's how I conjecture it's coming through that kind of stuff. I mean, it just, as I read it, I see it. But I'm not going to have to worry about going through the wrath because God's going to spare me from that. But there's going to be people who get saved in the midst of it all. And they're going to what? They're going to have to deal with it. Okay? And, and, and the beast, the pompous horn, is going to be fighting against them. So we know that these end time saints then will be persecuted by the beast during that second half of the final week. They're going to go through persecution. But you know what? That shouldn't take us by surprise. Because there have been many believers before that that have gone through persecution, okay? That have been eaten by lions, that have been burned at the stake, that have all these things, and God has allowed. And so as we're seeing in 1 Peter, that it at times is the will of God for us to suffer. And I better be able to be ready to deal with that because sometimes that is god's will that through my sufferings he is glorified people hear the message do you realize that the church grows the strongest and fastest during times of persecution the church of china is growing it's an amazing thing there are people getting saved in north korea even though it's stopped 
the message is being declared. So, applications real quick. Sovereignty of the ancient of days. God is sovereign over all things. He is the ultimate ruler. Nobody can, can, can make decisions that override his decisions. But then he is also the ultimate judge. In one day, we all, we all, and then everybody else outside us all, are going to stand before the ultimate judge. So I don't camp on this very, very often. But this is a moment to camp on it. If you died right now, right now, are you going to heaven? You're going to live forever. You're going to live forever. Everyone's living forever. The question is where are you going to spend that ever? Are you going to spend it in the presence of God or are you going to spend it in hell? Because hell is a reality. It's the burning lake of fire where the worm dies not. You can read Mark chapter 9 and read what, what Jesus says about it. You're going to get exactly what you wanted. You wanted everything like you wanted it. You want to be God. And God's going to say, fine, you got it for all of eternity. You're in your little bitty cubicle by yourself with nobody else. And you're going to be burning and you're going to be eaten alive. But you'll never die. That sounds awful. But that's what the Word of God says. It's not, it doesn't, that's not a feel good, is it? So if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, this isn't, I'm not, this is not how far I'm brimstone. I just want you to come and it doesn't mean anything. It's got to mean something. You, there's maybe people here today, you've said a sinner's prayer and you're still going to hell because you didn't mean it. You're getting fire insurance. Do you know what? Your life changes. John 8 is very clear. You'll know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. If your life hasn't changed, if you really don't, if sin doesn't bother you, you can live however you want to live, and you just show up on Sunday morning and you punch a clock, you punch the ticket. You're probably not his. I went to church for 23 years, but I honestly know that I wasn't saved. I didn't know him. I didn't care about him. Life totally changed. I understand now sin is an abomination, a stench in the eyes of my father. It bothers me that it bothers him. I wish it bothered me more that I wouldn't ever sin, that I was perfect. But it has changed the, the, the whole context of my life. I want to please him. I want purity. I want passion. I want privilege. I want power to glorify him. I wouldn't have told you that in my younger 20s. I wanted pleasure and pleasure. And pleasure, and pleasure. Those have been the four pillars of my life back then. Pleasure, 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 pleasure. All around the person of Bob. He's the ultimate judge. Don't forget it. Secondly then, lastly, the perplexity of Daniel. I don't want to leave this um, without this, because this is wonderful to me, how this whole thing ends. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me. <laughs> and my countenance changed. He's praying. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind he's praying for more understanding. And God gives him more understanding. And it's still not what? Total. It's still not totally clear. And what he does know troubles him. I say again? Blows his mind. But it troubles him because now he's reading about this pompous horn that's going to be coming. And he's going to be persecuting the saints and all this kind of stuff. You don't really want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, I want to know. But I don't want to know. Okay? And God in his mercy doesn't tell us everything how it's going to play out. He gives us enough to know how it's going to play out. Did you ever think about that? If God wanted me to know more, he'd what? He would have told me. He could have had John in the Revelation give us detailed accounts. Just as he did with Daniel. He could give us a name. Do you realize that he gave Isaiah the name of of the king who would rebuild the temple. The very name, Cyrus, my shepherd, he calls him. I think it's Daniel. When we get, when we get there, I'm gonna, I'll share that with you. But I think it's Daniel that God keeps alive long enough to tell Cyrus, you're the guy. God prophesied about you hundreds of years ago. By name. 
that you would be the guy after 70 years that, that God was going to have his people in, se- in exile for 70 years. And at the end of the 70 years, there would be a guy named Cyrus who was going to be raised up. And you're the guy. I can't believe this. I lived long enough to see you. And then, poof, we read the book of Ezra. And then Cyrus gave the decree to rebuild the temple. It didn't just happen out of the blue. God could have done that. And he could tell us, and, and in the end times, the pompous horn would come, and his name would be, or something like that. Make sense? So, but we'll know it, right? Because if we're living long enough, prophecy is best known when? It <laughs> After it happens. That's exactly right. So, his acceptance, though, of what was revealed. In the end, he accepted it. He accepted what he knew. He accepted what he didn't know. So, how does the consideration of future events affect you? Does it give you the willies? Like, does it make you nervous? Does it make you scared? Does it make you anxious? It shouldn't. Why? Because God is sovereign. And he's over it all. And it hasn't taken him by surprise. It's okay. Embrace the moment. John, love you, like your testimony, right? And so, you know, there's a part where you kind of like, ah, I struggle with it. But then you realize, no, God's, God's in control. And I want to embrace this moment because God's allowing this moment into my life in order for me to be a what? A witness, a light. I'm getting to go to the uh, tomorrow morning back to the, uh, <laughs> the car dealer that has done the work on my car that I've already been to a couple times last week for the same exact thing. And so I spent the whole week just making sure we weren't having just residual oil drippings. And so now I texted on Friday afternoon and he says, oh, I'll bring it in on Monday. So I'm going, I get to go. I get the privilege of going back. I can't remember. You know, if that one guy, when I shared the testimony of that one guy that saw me and he says, oh, you're back again. I can't wait to see his face tomorrow morning when I walk in. Anyways. You're back again. God's still good. God's still sovereign. He's still on the throne. And I think he wanted me to see you one more time. (laughs) Does that make sense? I mean, whatever. God is in control, even over my car. Amen? So, are you trusting then in the sovereignty of God? Do you have a desire to know the word of God more fully? And if you do, what are you doing to make it happen? Are you getting up earlier? Are you committing a block of time it, it doesn't just happen. It's not going to be, sort of, you know, just, you, you have to plan it. Make the plan and then stick to the plan, okay? You get up early, so I'm not going to, well, yesterday morning I, I got up at 4.15. We had the rescue mission, right? But I wanted time in God's word. Now, I, I didn't have the alarm set for 4.15. God woke me up at 4.15. So I got up, knowing that probably, I, he wanted, and you know what? I was late to pick you up, wasn't I? Because, man, I had a great quiet time. I, it was a great time in God's Word, which I wouldn't have had if I didn't submit to the Holy Spirit at the moment. Does it make sense? I'm not trying to pat my... I, mean, I'm, I can tell you the numerous times I haven't submitted to the Holy Spirit, okay? But I'm just telling you, when you submit to the Holy Spirit and, and you plan that time to be in God's Word, it's exciting stuff, okay? Even when you're going through the book of Leviticus, okay? And that's where my quiet time's at right now. And it was exciting stuff! So much so that I was running late. Okay? Are you willing to accept the fact that there will be things that God has not chosen or chosen not to reveal to us? That's the hard part. Because we always want the what? We want the answers. Okay? And so, at times, the saints of the Most High will be asked to glorify Him through suffering and persecution. What are you doing to strengthen your faith for when that happens? And is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Even as we talk about the potential for persecution and suffering, Lord, you are a good God. You are a gracious God. You are a faithful God. Um, And I just rejoice in you for that. Um, Lord, I pray that as you allow us to go through different types of sufferings, Lord, that we would remember that, that we would retain that, and we would be a light of your grace to those that are around us, Lord, that whatever the purpose is, whoever it is that you're surrounding us at the moment for us to be a, a witness to, that we would, we would be that for them, for their glory, for your glory, and for their, for their betterment, for their edification. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to be in your word then, um, that we would be continually be encouraged and nurtured through your truth, for your word is truth, that you would receive the glory through us individually and as assembly. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.